We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church. Man, isn't that great to see all that God's doing? You know, um, one thing that you didn't get to see through that is obviously we're a church that has a very clear purpose. Our ACC Men's Weekend Retreat uh, Getaway thing is coming up, and uh, October 24th is your deadline to get signed up for that. I'm super excited to see the incredible amount of men who have already signed up to be a part of that. We're going to have an incredible time together, and uh, make sure you sign up and go to our website for more information. All right, all that said, we're, we're in the second week of our series called Worlds Apart. And the whole idea behind this series is we're looking at what it is that we believe and what, as a, as a uh, hopefully you have a biblical worldview, and what other people in the world kind of believe and how oftentimes there's a big gap between what we believe and what others believe, and we would call that kind of, that, that worlds apart. There's sometimes a pretty big gap there. And the other part that's really important to understand in this series is that truth matters. Can we all agree on that? There is an absolute truth. If I have an apple, I can tell you that it's a banana, but it doesn't change it into a banana. An apple is an apple. In fact, truth matters also from a perspective of Scripture shows us how important truth is. In John 8, right, it says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, right? So there's an important uh, understanding that truth is like this, this key that unlocks freedom in our lives. So when we know what it is that we believe to be true, and we know what other people believe to be true, what it does is it gives us an opportunity to explore with our thinking minds and our hearts and our souls what is actually true, because that's the foundation we need to build our life on. And I would argue that through, through this series, you're going to hear a theme that the only worldview worth building your life on is what we call a biblical worldview, that this book is true and it's worth building your house on. But today, in order to help us understand that more, uh, we're going to look at essentially a, a worldview called naturalism. Uh, it goes by a lot of other names. You might know uh, nihilism or atheism or scientific materialism or secular humanism. There's all sorts of words for it, but ultimately what we're going to look at is this concept of a naturalistic worldview. And when you look at the entirety of the world, when you take everyone in the world and you ask them, what is your religious belief system? What worldview do you hold to? Uh, 16% of the world will check a box called none, no religious affiliation. 
And most of the time, the people that are in this, that check this box that say they have no religious affiliation, 16% of the world, what they're really saying is that they have some sort of a naturalistic, nihilistic, uh, scientific, humanistic worldview, okay? And so we're going to explore what those people believe. Now, it's 16%, but I would argue that that number is actually much higher. There are a lot of people that will check a box. You know, they'll say, oh, I'm Jewish, I'm Catholic, I'm Christian, I'm whatever. But what they're really telling you is, I grew up in a family that that uses this word, but I don't technically hold to any of those beliefs. So the people that just checked that box, 16%, probably higher. Today, we're going to explore what they believe to be true, someone who holds a naturalistic or atheistic worldview. Now, one thing you're going to notice is that people who hold this naturalistic worldview will claim, okay, they'll make the claim that they have the upper hand when it comes to science and rational thought and logic when it comes to understanding how the world is viewed. They will also claim that faith has no part of their worldview system. Now, what we're going to see today is that both of those things are false, that both of those things are aren't quite true. They're not always untrue, but they're, they're not true. We're going to see that today. And I want to encourage you in this room to not be afraid to think through these things. I don't want anyone in this room to think that just because the pastor says something or because the Bible says something or because your parents have said something that you're just supposed to check your brain at the door. And you're just supposed to accept all the things that maybe are said on this stage. That's not how God calls us to go through life. In fact, in Matthew 22, it says, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all of your mind. Like, we have access to think through these things and to ask hard questions and to really explore why do we believe what we believe Why do you believe what you believe? Why do other people believe what they believe? Let's ask these hard questions so that at the end of the day, if if only one of them is true, I don't know about you, but I want to build my world, I want to build my house on top of a view of the world that is true. I want to build it on something sturdy. And that's why we're going through this. And I, I would argue, and you're going to see this today, that a biblical worldview is unique And that our worldview is based on science and reason and faith. There's this incredible balance of all three of these things that come together. And when you're trying to understand the world in which you live, science, reason, and faith are all going to be necessary. And we're going to explore that today. But first, let's uh, let's go to God and ask him to be part of this time of learning in a word of prayer. Father, I ask that you would speak through me today, that you would allow me to, to... communicate clearly what it is that you'd like each of us to hear. I pray that what you share with us today, that it would just whet our appetite, that we would be hungry to learn more, that we would want to spend time in your word and and talking to you in prayer and and exploring uh, other views of the world around us by spending time on our own growing in our faith. So God, we thank you for this time together. I pray that you'd speak through me, allow us to all understand what it is that's being taught, that you would allow us not just to hear it, but to apply it to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I hope you're ready to learn today, because I have a a, a bunch of information based on our limited time. Again, like I was just praying, I'm hoping just to whet your appetite. Our goal at ACC is not to feed you seven days worth of, of spiritual food. Our goal is to whet your appetite and to teach you how to feed yourself so that tomorrow you want to go home and and spend time in God's word and spend time talking to him in prayer and same thing Tuesday and beyond, okay? So let's uh, first define a few terms. You're all welcome to class today. We're going to define three things before we get into uh, some, some more about what God's word says about all this. But the first words I want to define are the words natural and supernatural. What is the difference between these? When we talk about uh, a naturalistic worldview, you're going to hear these words come up. So the word natural, uh, the natural world is made up of, of three elements, time, matter, and space. All right, so everything uh, is kind of follows a certain order, right? One o'clock comes before two o'clock. That's, that's the order of time. We understand matter or the things we can see and touch and kind of the, the, that kind of stuff. And, and space, the distance between us, there's an absolute truth that there's a space between us and that it all, time, matter, and space make up this natural world. 
They, our natural world can be mostly observed using our five senses. Now, there are parts of our natural world that you might not be able to use your senses to see. There's going to be things that are too small, too big, too invisible, right? Uh, to, you can't see wind, but you can feel it. So there's things that you might not be able to observe fully, but it also can be studied through science, Right? We, we have these processes by which we want to understand the natural world we live in, and we can repeat things and go through a scientific process and actually figure out patterns that prove to be true over time. A theory turns into a law of science, and, and we can, you know, a lot of math and all that stuff, okay? So that's the natural. Well, there's also an understanding of what if there is a supernatural world. Well, a supernatural world is, is a little different. A supernatural world is outside of time, matter, and space, a supernatural world is mostly cannot be observed using your five senses, and a supernatural experience usually cannot be understood through the scientific method. When I say usually, it, you can't, right? You, you can't take something supernatural and take a scientific natural process to prove whether or not that thing is true or not. It's two separate things, natural and supernatural. In fact, the word super in this instance, you go back to the Latin, it basically just means outside of. So if you are super at work, right? If your boss writes you a review and says, man, he's just super. What that really means is you're outside of the, the standard expectation of what was expected of you, that your work is uh, beyond that expectation, you're outside of. And what we really mean when we say supernatural is if there is something outside of this natural world uh, then there's a supernatural, something outside of it, okay? So that's what these words mean. But I also want to define this, this worldview called naturalism. So naturalism, you see that we have the word natural in the word naturalism. That'll make sense in just a second. So naturalism, sometimes it goes by the, the, the phrase uh, nihilism or scientific materialism, secular humanism, or uh, more kind of in the church circle, we, we call this atheism. Atheism just means no God, right? There's no theistic understanding of, of a supernatural entity. So this worldview is a simply, right? It's a worldview that does not acknowledge the, anything outside of our natural world. In other words, there is no supernatural. So if you're in this room right now, and you have an understanding that there's a natural world that you exist in right now, but you don't have a belief system that there's anything beyond this world, then this would be the worldview that we're talking about today, this naturalistic, nihilistic, uh, atheistic worldview. And to break this down a little bit more, last week we talked about six control questions. I encourage you to go back and watch it. But essentially every worldview is going to answer six questions differently, all right? And here's the six questions uh, as far, far as a naturalist is concerned. The first question would be a question of, of the question of God. Well, a naturalist would say there is no God. In fact, if you're really trying to put the, the role of who's in charge on somebody's shoulders, it's you, right? You get to decide what's best for you. You are God to you, okay? But ultimately, there is no supernatural God. Uh, they would also, in the question of reality, they would say that only the natural world exists. What's here that you can explore with science, that you can test with your senses, etc. That's all that exists. Everything else is not real. The question of knowledge. They would say that science can explain everything. And the things that science can't explain, it's not that science can't explain it. They would say that science just can't explain it yet that we're still developing our science, and as soon as science catches up, we'll be able to answer all those questions in the natural world, all right? And the question of origin, right, they would say that there is this, this Big Bang. In fact, before even the Big Bang, right, some primordial soup, and that out of that, that came from maybe some other dimension, um, from, from, I don't know, but at some point, there was this Big Bang, and from that came everything that you and I can now test with our natural Senses, okay? So that's kind of the question of, of origin. The question of ethics is the consensus decides on rules to live by. All right, so most people in the naturalistic worldview is how do you know it's right and wrong? Well, we took a vote and we decided you shouldn't steal. Right? Essentially, uh, boil it down, it's just make sure to enjoy life 
before you die. That's a basic ethic, right? Just try to get the most out of life before you die. And as long as you can get a bunch out of life without taking from someone else, don't, don't ruin someone else's right to enjoy their life, but you do you, let them do them, and that's just kind of a basic ethic of a naturalist, all right? And here's the last question, is a question of afterlife. And essentially, an after, a naturalist would say that you're worm food, all right? When you die, the lights go out, and they put you in the ground somewhere, burn you up, whatever, and you just become uh, dust at some point. Let me make a, a, an observation here. Now, you might be a naturalist and disagree with me on this. That's all right. Um, I hope that's not the, tr- the truth, but um, it doesn't really matter how you answer these questions. There is an absolute truth to these questions. Now, I believe that my view is in alignment with truth, and I'm sure a naturalist believes that their view is more aligned with truth, and that's why there's a world apart between the way we view the world and what we believe to be true. But it doesn't change what is actually true. The question of afterlife, for example, I believe that there is a real place called heaven and that it's eternal. And I believe that there's a real place called hell and that it is eternal. And it doesn't matter what somebody else believes about heaven or hell, their belief about it doesn't change whether or not it exists or not. Right? There is an absolute truth. So we should be really, really careful about exploring what is true and how we answer these questions. See, I would suggest that there are some serious problems with this list behind me if atheists claim, if naturalists claim to rely on science and reason to get to these conclusions, I would say there's some major problems. I want to explore some of that with you this morning. You see, in order actually to come up with these answers, I would say you actually have to have tremendous faith, which doesn't quite make sense, but I'll explain that as well. So let's take a look. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put some biblical worldview things on the left side of the screen, and I'm going to compare them to a naturalistic worldview on the right side of the screen, and hopefully we'll understand this all a little bit better. But essentially, one thing that you're going to find about a biblical worldview, I think that our our worldview needs to include both uh, science, reason, and faith to kind of make up the whole picture. But the first one, let's talk about Science, all right? A biblical worldview discovers truth about the natural world through science. So let me kind of explode a myth real fast. There's kind of this myth out there, again, that if you follow a biblical worldview, that if you're a Christian, that somehow you are at odds with science, that science is the enemy, and that, again, when you come into the doors, you have to check your brain at the door because there's no science or logical, rational thought allowed here. Well, that's completely stupid, okay? I I want you to understand that in a biblical worldview, we believe that we discover truth about this natural world through science. There's incredible uh, people who hold to a biblical worldview and are scientists at the same time and love to explore the world around us. In fact, it says in Psalm 111 verse 2, it says, great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. See, the reason we study science, the reason we study physics, the reason we study astronomy, the reason we study all these things is because there's something incredible about the world that has been created, and we want to understand it, and science is a gift from God to us to understand what he wants us to understand. You see, science helps those who hold a biblical worldview understand how things work within the realm of time matter, and space. In the natural world, how does all this work? Things that follow natural laws. Now, a naturalistic worldview actually would hold the same thing, right? We say that we discover truth about the natural world through science. Well, a naturalistic worldview also seeks to do the same thing. They also want to understand the natural world through science. So, there's not really a uniqueness between us. Now, a naturalistic worldview person, holder, would say that they don't believe that a biblical worldview uses science. But again, uh, I I know plenty of incredible scientists. I know we teach science in my home, and I know your kids are learning science. Science is important and valuable. In fact, 
think about this. You know, when we say that from a naturalistic worldview, there's a belief that everything kind of came into existence out of a, a big bang, right? That, that at some point there was an explosion, the, 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 the heat just got too hot, and everything just got right, and everything came together, and boom, an explosion came. Well, well listen, I want you to understand that when I, as a, bib, a holder of a biblical worldview, explore science and look at all the, the answers to where things came from, what you call cosmology, the study of origins, I, I actually land at the same place. I think science really does point to this really cool truth that everything kind of came into existence from one moment and kind of burst forth from there. Now, we definitely disagree, a naturalist and I, on who caused that to happen. But we can use science to really understand that at some point, everything, time, matter, and space kind of came into existence somehow. I believe that. I think science points to that. Here's the second thing. A biblical worldview, right, recognizes truth about the supernatural world through reason. In other words, what I'm trying to say here is that if you hold to a biblical worldview, when you take logical thought and reasoning and you kind of put it all together, what it's going to point to is the existence of something supernatural. Romans puts it this way in Romans verse 1. It says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. What Paul is saying here to the people in Rome when he writes this letter is, listen, when you just look at all that has been made, all that exists, whether you believe there is someone who made it or not, when you just look at it, it's going to scream that there was a creator behind all this, that there was something outside of nature that caused all of this to happen. There's going to be a logic and a, a rational thought behind it that the only possible answer is something bigger than and outside of the natural world must have caused all of this to happen. You see, a naturalistic worldview, though, would claim that there is no supernatural world while rejecting some logical reasoning. Now, let me explain what I mean by that, because that's quite a claim. For me to get up on stage and speak on behalf of a naturalist, to say, listen, I believe that they land at a place that there is no natural or supernatural world, and that they have to, the only way they can get there is by denying some actual rational logical thought. Let me show you a few instances of where this is true. Now, I could spend three, four days talking through science and how their own, a naturalist's own science disproves much of what they believe to be true. But let me just show you two examples. One example is in a, a law called the first law of thermodynamics. All right, so uh, getting get a little heavy for you for just a moment, but let me, let me show you some science here. Uh, the first law of thermodynamics says that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So a scientist would say, uh, listen, it's been proven in the natural world that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Yet somehow, okay, they claim to be using logical, rational A, B, B to C you know, logical, orderal, uh, ordered thoughts to come up with, they're fine that an origin account is based solidly on everything creating itself into existence with, with a bang, without any influence outside of nature. How? How can you be consistent in saying that I hold to a scientific law that nothing can, that something can't create itself, and yet at the same time believe that everything was created out of nothing? How do you get there? without a tremendous faith in something. And now, they would probably answer, well, we don't know where, well, you know, what happened before the Big Bang? What was there? Well, we don't quite know. Some sort of primordial soup. All right, well, how'd the soup get there? Uh, well, we don't know. It came from another dimension. Well, where did that other dimension come from? And that sounds really supernatural, by the way, to me. Well, where did that come from? Uh, we don't know. That sounds like an awful lot like faith to me faith in something supernatural. But they're not willing to give it those words. How about this one, the second law of thermodynamics? Second law of thermodynamics ultimately says a system will become more disordered 
and chaotic as time increases. So again, a naturalist is going to say, I believe in science. Science has proven that a system will always become more disordered and chaotic over time. In other words, left to chance, uh, things will be, get, become more, you know, less, more or less uh, become more chaotic. If you walked into someone's house and on their dining room table was a completed puzzle, you're not going to imagine ever. You're not going to walk in and just assume that that puzzle put itself together. You're definitely not going to assume that someone opened up a box and threw the puzzle up in the air and all the pieces just landed right where they were supposed to and kind of fell into place. You wouldn't assume that because we understand that if you take a completed puzzle and you throw it up in the air, that what you're going to get is pieces all over the place. You're going to get less order, not more order, right? We know through logical, rational, reasonable thinking that every book has an author, that every song has a composer, that the house you're going to go home to today has a builder, that, that something that is ordered didn't happen that way on its own because we understand the second law of thermodynamics. If I were to take a can, you, how many of you love uh, SpaghettiOs? Any SpaghettiOs fans in here? All right. A few. All right, that's fun. Remember the SpaghettiOs that were like A through Z, alphabet SpaghettiOs? They weren't just the O's. You got the whole alphabet. Imagine if I took a can of alphabet SpaghettiOs, and I opened it up on stage, right? And I just said, hey, watch this. And I threw it up in the air. Like, if, if when I was done, all of those pieces, it just, let's just say a few of them landed together and made a complete sentence in the English language. Like, we would be like, that, that's impossible. That, that doesn't happen. Some sort of magic trick must have happened because we understand the second law of thermodynamics, that things don't become more orderly without some intentionality. Things become more chaotic. There's actually, in the naturalistic train of thought, to try to understand how you could get order out of chaos they have a theorem, and it's actually called the infinite monkey theorem. You can look it up. Here's the infinite monkey theorem. That if you take a computer and you put a monkey in front of it and teach that monkey how to go like this on the keys, that given enough time, given enough opportunities and tossing out paper as it comes out wrong, given enough time, eventually you will get the complete works of Shakespeare. It just accidentally, you know, the first time, nope, not the right one. Second time, first letter, yep, that's the first letter. Nope, not the right one. That if you just give it enough tries, eventually the order of all the buttons being pressed, you'll eventually get the complete works of Shakespeare. Man, I do not have enough faith to be an atheist. <laughs> to me, the only way that you get the complete works of Shakespeare is by having a creator named Shakespeare who is created by an intelligent, loving God to put all that together. The supernatural is the only reasonable solution that makes sense. How do you hold a consistent position that things become more disordered over time and yet from a random explosion came order, logic, language, DNA? Like, what, where, how do you get there? Just take one strand of DNA. I'm sorry, I keep giving these illustrations. I just love this, okay? Take one strand of DNA, and in order to just represent the amount of data that's stored in one strand of your DNA, I'd have to take 1,000 of those Bibles that are underneath the chair in front of you, 1,000 of them and put them on stage, and the amount of data that's all the, the letters of the alphabet that make up all those pages, front and back, all the way through 1,000 different Bibles, all that information could be stored on one single strand of DNA. In fact, 
uh, naturalistic and uh, uh, all, all the worldview scientists, okay? You take all the scientists, and one of the things that they can actually agree on is that if you took a teaspoon and filled it with just DNA, the amount of data that could be stored in that teaspoon of DNA is equal to all of the data that has ever existed in this world. Every one and zero on a server somewhere, every book in every library, all the data could all be... And yet, somehow... To try to explain, where did, you know, the, where did DNA come from? Oh, it must have come from RNA. Okay, where did RNA come from? This incredible language. Well, listen, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I'm just telling you, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. There are major, major logical fallacies with this view. In fact, I would say it's not a reasonable position. How about this third thing? A biblical worldview accepts what God chose not to reveal through faith. God has revealed a lot of things to us. He's given us science to explore the natural world. He's given us his revelation called his word to, to, to see more about the things that he wants us to understand about the supernatural world. But there's going to be some things that, that his revelation and that, that science and that reasonable, logical thought aren't going to be able to answer. And for all those things, we recognize that that's where faith comes in. There's things that God hasn't revealed about who he is. He hasn't told us those things about him yet. And we accept that God chose not to reveal certain things. A naturalistic worldview, though, wrongly claims that faith plays no part in their worldview. That they don't have any part of their worldview that's based on any sort of faith. Yet Hebrews 1.11 says this, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for and is the evidence of things we cannot see. In other words, faith is what happens when you have something that you can't quite understand. You don't quite know, uh, can't quite use science to understand it or prove it or whatever. Listen, both worldviews, whether you hold a biblical worldview or a naturalistic worldview, there are tons of both worldviews that can't be solidly answered in a way that everyone is just like, I've got all the answers. I've got it all figured out. Both systems require faith. And yet somehow, I don't quite get why, in the separation of church and state, this is just a one-off statement, separation of church and state, right, one of the systems is allowed as a system of faith because it's science, and one, uh, somehow the one that I hold, a biblical worldview, is, is weird. I could go off on that for quite a while, but here's Here's what the Bible says is the cause of you and me and the world we live in. The question of origin. It says in Colossians 1 that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. That he existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. You see, God created everything in the natural world and everything in the supernatural world. And he made the things we cannot see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, and kingdoms, and rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds it all together. Listen, when, whenever we wrap up a message here, we always ask we, we challenge you to ask yourself this question, what now, God? What is it now that we should do with this information as we explore? I wanna, I wanna challenge you to do two things. One, don't be afraid to ask questions and to use the mind that God has given to you. Because I, I believe in all my heart that when you use science and when you use rational thought and thinking and when you use faith and you put those things together, you're gonna solidly land on a biblical worldview. We shouldn't be afraid to ask those questions because those questions are going to bring us to a place of a solid biblical worldview. You see, in my brain, this is some math thoughts for a moment. I believe, right, that the first cause of the universe must have been non-spatial because it created space. 
I believe the first cause of the universe must have been immaterial because it created matter. It must have been timeless because it created time. It must have been incredibly wise because it put all three of those things together with such incredible precision that life is even possible. And therefore, I believe in a powerfully supernatural God that created time, matter, and space with incredible precision and love for his creation. Now, unbelievers, you may call this thing whatever you want, this thing that must have existed before anything else. God's word has a name for him. God, Jehovah, Yahweh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, existing eternally in three distinct persons, but together as one God who created you and created all things. And his word explains these things to us. And what it doesn't explain, we're asked to step out in faith and understand that when we use science and reason and faith, that we're going to find ourselves landing solidly on a biblical worldview. The second thing I want to ask you to consider, not only to, to encourage you to think through this, but if you're in this room and you've never made a decision to follow God's word and his way of doing things, which means to, to commit your life to doing things Jesus's way, to submit to the truth of the gospel that God sent his son to this earth to die on the cross in your place. And then by placing your faith in him, a God who is 100% natural and 100% supernatural all at the same time, that God was able to take your place and pay for your sin on the cross so that one day you can go from this natural world and live forever with God in a supernatural experience. If you don't believe that today, I want to encourage you. That's the, that's the starting point right there. Say, so I want to trust in a biblical worldview, and I want to build my life on that. Would you find me after service? Would you come find someone with a lanyard, one of our pastors? It doesn't matter. We would love to talk to you about the next steps to take in your faith. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this book. Thank you for your revelation. Thank you that in it, we can see that by using science, by using reason and logical thought, rational thinking, and by ultimately seeing that there's elements where you call us to step up into faith, the things that we can't quite see and prove, that when we put all those things together, we can land solidly on a worldview that's based on your, the truth of your word and on who you say you are. God, I pray there wouldn't be a single person in this church that longs to walk out of this place today building their house on any worldview other than the view of the world you've given to us. God, we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.